you. Do you have an empty well? God fills. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The way to receive this everlasting life is to admit that you are a sinner and you've come short of the glory of God. Secondly, believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and then confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Listen, you're never too lost, never too lost to be saved. Join myself and Pastor Pam. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all iniquities. We welcome you to the Singwell. So you're covered in light <laughs> And the valley's gloom Like a rosebud in the light yeah. Yes mm-hmm. Hear the call to attention Feel the change in the air For the ground is dry But the clouds are overhead Yes they Again. Come alive, come alive, come alive, dry bones. Come alive, 
Praise the Lord, everybody, and God bless. Welcome to the Sing Well. I am Pamela Bynum, and I'm the lead pastor here at the Sing Well, and I'm so excited about what we're going to experience together on today. Now, for us, this is a day of rest, a day of rest. That is R-E-S-T. Let me tell you why I spelled that out. Rest. Remember every spoken truth. Did you catch that? Remember every spoken truth. R-E-S-T. Remember every spoken truth. That's what I want you to do while we rest. I want you to remember and reflect on every scripture that has been taught. Remember every spoken truth as we go into this season of remembering. Now, why am I bringing this up? We taught a series called The Power to Be. The power to be. And in that series, we challenged you to hold on, grasp on, remember, reflect and respond to what God has given us. All right. And this is one statement that we, we were um, driving home in that message. And I want you to write this down. OK, I want you to write this down. Write, ugh, write, write this down. OK, remember me at all times consistently focusing on the God that has given you the power to be. Now, when I say remember me at all times, I'm not talking about remembering me, remembering Pastor Pam, Apostle Pam. No, I'm asking you to remember God. Okay. Remember him. All right. So let's write this down. This is, this is God speaking to you. This is from his perspective. Remember me at all times consistently focusing on the God that has given you the power to be. All right, let's say it again. Remember me at all times, consistently focusing on the God that has given you the power to be. Now, in that series, we challenged you with this. And by, by the following statement, and I want you to write this down, okay? Are you ready? Do not allow the enemy to do a better job at sifting than you do at remembering. I'm going to say it again. You know, I'm going to say it again. Give you a chance to write it down. OK, here we go. Do not allow the enemy to do a better job at sifting than you do at remembering. One more time. I think I will. Here we go. Do not allow the enemy to do a better job at sifting than you do at remembering. And that takes us into the, to today's message as we welcome Pastor Robert, Robert Madu. Now, Pastor Robert Madu is from Trinity Church in Cedar Hills, Texas, and he travels the globe preaching the gospel in a unique and dynamic way as he strives to make any, every individual aware that God is for them and that he has a specific purpose and a plan for their lives. Now, the message we're going to watch today, um, Pastor Robert Madu is a guest with uh, Pastor Greg Cro. Craig Groeschel with Life Church. And in this message, he's teaching the following title. Are you ready? Don't forget to remember. Don't forget to remember. Now, uncertainty can drive us to fear. It can drive us to worry. It can drive us to doubt. But it's also an invitation to hope. Okay. When you're faced with something you can't, when you're faced with something that you just can't handle on your own, don't forget to remember who worked the miracles in the past and that he, God, has the power to do it again. And it's just right in line, right in line with where we're going into. So while we are taking our day of rest, that means the chat will be closed. We're going to give our team a chance to sit back and receive and respond as we reflect on remembering. All right. And 
I want you to take notes. I want you to just really allow your heart to be open to receive what God is saying is speaking at this time. And then we're going to come back together and we're going to walk through this because I want you to remember. And then I want you to respond. Hallelujah. And, and just be blessed by what God is saying in this message. Okay. All right, everyone. God bless you. And you know what? Right before we go to this um, next segment, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word. Hallelujah. God, and I thank you for your presence. Lord, I pray now, Lord, that you uh, allow your anointing to come upon the word that's coming forth, Lord Jesus, and that you prepare our hearts to receive this word. Oh, a good seed sown in our hearts, Lord God, that it may take root and, 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 and spring forth as a response of life transformation and testimony, Lord God. Lord God, I pray that um, our ears are open to hear what you are saying to us. That's the beauty of our God. He can speak one word, but it can impact and touch each and every one of our lives that way. So I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you see us on a, you speak to us in a grand stage of life, but you're, you're so, you're so powerful that it can touch us in the individual way. So Lord God, have your way, have your way, have your way, Holy Spirit. And I pray Lord God that, uh, um, that you are positioning us to receive and respond as we reflect on the opportunities that remind us not to forget, to remember who you are and who you have always been. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Family, get ready for a powerful word. God bless. Hi, from Trinity Church in the greater Dallas area, would you help me welcome today, Pastor Robert Madu. Thank you. Oh, hello, Life Church. You may be seated. How are you, Life Church? Hey, it is good to be back. I have a rule as I've traveled over the years that when you come to a church the first time, you're still kind of in the guest category. But if you get the honor of coming back, then you're straight up family. So I hope you know I'm in the family now. I'm in the family. And I want to welcome you wherever you are watching, all the locations, whether you're at home. I am fully convinced that if there is life on Mars, there will be a life church there one day. And uh, that just speaks to how awesome this church is. And it is a privilege to be here. I cannot say enough about Pastor Craig and Amy Groeschel. Uh, I want to thank you for your life, for your leadership. Uh, he could have anybody standing behind this pulpit, and it is an honor uh, to be here. Thank you uh, for saying yes to the call of God. It's impacting the world, and I think we ought to give honor to where honor is due. In the chats, every location, let them know how much you love them. Love you so much. Okay, I'm going to jump straight into the Word of God. I hope you lean in, you're engaged. If you're at home, you can type amen, shout amen. If you're at one of the locations, uh, I believe this is going to speak to you today. I want to look at Mark chapter 5, and it's quite a bit of Scripture, uh, but come on, you'll get your Bible reading in for the week. Mark chapter 5, and we'll look at verse number 21 and land all the way at verse number 43. And when you're ready to read it, say, yeah. 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 If you need a little time to find Mark, say, hold on. I'll wait for you. I'll wait for you to find it. And it says, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, how many of you think it's good to hear about Jesus? Thank God this is going around the world so people can hear about Jesus. She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him and he turned around 
in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you're going to sit up here and ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, one version says, ignoring what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? That girl not dead? She's just asleep. (laughs) They did what you did. They laughed at him. And after he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was, took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and then told them, don't just stand there and look at the girl. Go to Chick-fil-A and get her something to eat real quick. Okay, a lot of scripture, a lot of scripture, but I needed you to get all of it. And I have to tell you, in full sermon Uh, prep disclosure, when I was making this message, I I almost titled this sermon, Get Up, because that's a good sermon title, Get Up, because I thought that really the climax of this miracle was Jesus telling this little girl who was dead to get up. Upon further reflection, I realized that was a premature title, premature title, simply because of verses 40 and 41. And I want us to hone in on those verses, because it says, but they laughed at him. They left. Who is the they? The negative, doubting, unbelieving, faithless, cantankerous people that were in. You know those people that know how to light up a room when they walk out? (laughs) Don't point at anybody. Uh, Those people that like for every solution, they will find a problem. That's the they. It says they laughed at him. And it says after he, that's Jesus, put them all out. Jesus put them out. In fact, the Greek suggests that he physically put them out. I see, I don't want to mess up your theology or your Christology today because some of you think that Jesus is just kind and sweet and loving and caring and he's a good, good father. And he is, but this scripture lets me know, do not get it confused. He is so, so gangster because all of those (laughs) negative, doubting, unbelieving people who are messing up the atmosphere, he said, oh no, all y'all got to get out. Oh yeah, you ain't got to go home. You got to get out of here. Once they got out, then he went to the little girl and said, get up. Life Church, what if the power of a miracle is not just in the miracle itself, but rather in the atmosphere and the environment that surrounds a miracle? Could it be possible that you've been looking at situations in your life telling them to get up? But this is actually the season of your life to start checking your environment and tell some things to get Oh, come on. Somebody just say, get out. That, that's what I want to preach about today. Wherever you are, would you give God some praise and just say, get out. Yeah. Say, get out. Yeah. Get out. Let's pray a long prayer. Jesus, speak to us today. Amen. <laughs> Life Church family, the divine intersection and really collision of characters in the scripture we read today, immediately gave me a nostalgic, parental, fatherhood flashback to November 2014. I remember it quite vividly because I was getting ready to leave our home in Dallas, Texas to go preach at a conference, which isn't anything unusual. I often go leave and preach at a conference, except this time, everything was different. Everything was different. Because not just leaving the house as a uh, husband, This time I was leaving the house as a father, my firstborn daughter, Everly, we call her Evie. She had just been born and I was in that emotional position of leaving my firstborn daughter for the very first time. Come on, every parent will attest to the fact, things are just different with your first child. 
Come on, there are things that happen with your first child that none of your other children will experience, okay? Like now my wife Taylor and I, we have three kids plus a demonic dog. So <laughs> when I leave the house now, I leave like I got warrants for my arrest <laughs> and I take the long scenic route home, okay? In fact, often, often Taylor would call me sometimes with just chaos in the background. She'd be like, babe, where are you? I'm like, I'm in traffic. She's like, no, you're in the driveway. I see you. Come in the house and help me <laughs> with these kids. <laughs> but when it's your first, it's different. So I was emotional, to say the least. Tears are going this way. Snot's going the other way. Big dramatic exit. And I get to the conference. I'm still emotional when I walk into the conference. And a guy by the name of Eddie James is leading worship when I go to the conference. Finished preaching, and the sermon was short that night, and I go in the green room afterwards, and Eddie James, the worship leader, says, Robert, congrats on your daughter. She's beautiful. I said, thank you. I made her. <laughs> I then said, uh, hey, Eddie, you know, my daughter Evie might not have ever been born if it wasn't for you. Eddie looked at me like I had lost my mind. I said, Eddie, you probably don't remember this, but in December 2006, you were scheduled to lead worship and preach at Christ for the Nations Institute in Dallas, Texas. But en route to Dallas, your van broke down on the side of the road. Eddie goes, I remember that night. I said, Eddie, you picked up your phone and you called a man by the name of Adam McCain. And you let him know that by the time your van would be fixed, there was no way you would make the service, so you had to cancel. Adam McCain got off the phone with you and looked at a room full of people and said, Eddie just, James just canceled for our Tuesday night student chapel. Who in the world are we going to get last minute to fill his spot? In that room was a man by the name of Brian Ming. He lifts up his hand and says, hey, I just heard this young guy named Robert Madu preach. He's local here in Dallas. Maybe he can do it. All of a sudden, my phone rings and a voice on the other line says, is this Pastor Robert Madu? I immediately dropped my voice real low and said, well, yes, it is. He said, I know this is crazy, this is last minute, but we just had a cancellation for our Tuesday night student chapel. Is there any way you would be available to come and preach to our Bible college students? Now, keep in mind, during this time of my life, I myself am a Bible college student at Southwestern Assemblies of God University. So I said to him, you know what? It seems like yesterday I was a Bible college student myself. What an honor it would be to come in part to your young people. <laughs> Drove from Southwestern to Christ for the Nations Institute. I'm about to get up and preach. But before I do, they say, hold on, it's Tuesday. So we've got a testimony video. And they show a testimony of a girl in their student body. And she tells her story of Jesus changing her life. I don't meet the girl. I preach that night. I'm at my school the next day, walking down the hallway. A girl taps me on my shoulder and goes, hey, was that you that I saw last night at Christ for the Nations getting ready to preach? I said, yeah. She goes, did you see that girl on the screen while you, before you preached? I said, yes, I did. She said, I've known that girl for years. I've known you for years. And I always thought that you two would be perfect for each other, but I never said anything. But the fact that you were there preaching and they showed her video, you two have got to meet. The next week, that girl and I went on our very first date at the illustrious International House of Pancakes. <laughs> I said, Eddie, to make a long story short, that girl's name was Taylor Mitchell. It's now Taylor Madu. We did what married people do. Evie is the evidence of that. Eddie, I am so glad your van broke down on the side of the road that day. <laughs> and I share that story, first of all, to give some hope to the single people. Come on. But also to say, who would have ever thought that Eddie and my Evie were connected. Because their connection is not one that is easily seen on the surface, but once you begin to peel back the layers, it becomes clear that every single one of us, we do not get the luxury of autonomy, but how many you know all of us are connected? We are deeply connected. Miracles merge with miracles. Testimonies have a way of touching each other. We are all connected. You might not like the person you sit next to or is in the house with you right now, but please believe you are connected. In fact, this pandemic has shown us that we are more connected than we realize we are all connected. It's powerful to understand that our lives are not straight lines. Our lives are links because all of us are deeply and intrinsically connected. In my text today, Mark begins by talking about this synagogue leader by the name of Jairus, but then he starts talking about this woman with an issue of blood. And the reason Mark has merged these two stories together is because the two of them are 
connected. In fact, to talk about Jairus, the synagogue leader, and never discuss the one with the issue of blood is really to do an injustice to this passage because the two of them are connected. Oh, deeply connected. Now, not on the surface, not on the surface. If you look at the surface of their lives, they couldn't be more opposite. Come on, if you look at the surface, one of these things is not like the other. Come on, f- first of all, Jairus is a man, she is a woman. Different. Jairus is named in the text. The Bible doesn't even give us this woman's name. Jairus is a ruler in the Jewish synagogue. This woman can't even come near the synagogue because her sickness has made her ceremonially unclean. Uh, The culture would suggest that Jairus is affluent. He's probably got some money in the bank. But this woman is broke, busted, and disgusted, and has spent all she had on worthless physicians. Let me bring the text to today. Jairus is a Democrat. This woman is a Republican. Jairus is an OU fan. This woman is a Texas fan. They're just just completely opposite. They have absolutely no nothing in common on the surface, but life has put them in the exact same place and position because they both have been hit with something that they knew they could not handle. Come on, how many know life has a way to do that? Life has a way of evening the playing field. Life has a way of hitting you upside the head with some stuff. Come on, that your money can't fix, your friends can't fix. Come on, we're facing it right now. Life has a way of taking your breath away. Life has a way of making an ace you say, whoo, God, I need you right now. Life can hit you with things you cannot handle. And might I suggest if you're watching this and you've been hit with something you can't handle, that means that thing is a job for Jesus. That's time for you to just throw up your hands and say, God, I don't know what to do about this. Surely you can do something. Woo. Look at Jairus and this woman. Nothing in common on the surface. Both ended up in the same position having to push people out the way to get an appointment with Jesus. Would you do me a favor? Would you, oh, never mind, uh-uh, social distancing. I was gonna tell you to push somebody, but don't do that. But in the t- chats, just type push, 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 and somebody just say push. Both of them had to push people out the way to get an appointment with Jesus. I love that. I love that neither one of them had a pretty pathway with rose petals to Jesus, but they both had to, had to be inconvenienced and push people out, the, excuse me, push people out the way to get something they never got before. You know why they're pushing? I'll tell you why they're pushing. They both had to push to Jesus because desperate people do desperate things. How many know when you are desperate for God, you approach God differently? When you are really desperate for God, oh, you don't care what other people think about you when you are lifting up your hands in worship. Oh, when you are desperate for God, you will pray three times a day. In fact, let me be clear, God did not send this pandemic, but he is using this pandemic to wake some people up out of their lethargic attitude and complacent Christianity, saying you need to get desperate for me, desperate to see change in your family, desperate to see change in a generation, all desperation will open up doors that complacency keeps shut. There's something about being desperate, and I love that it was desperation that brought Jairus and this woman both at the feet of Jesus. Are you bored yet? Because I really want to delve into the details of their desperation. Jairus, he gets to Jesus first, and boy, is he desperate. He's desperate because his little girl, his baby girl. She is dying. Hear that? She is dying. When he gets to Jesus, he is not casually approaching Jesus. He is talking to Jesus with the vocal intonation of a 911 caller saying, Jesus, hurry up and come to my house right now. This woman is just as desperate, but her situation has been going on for a while now, this hemorrhaging that's occurring in her body. And watch how much Mark, the gospel writer, wants us to know that the two of them are connected. Because it just so happens that Jairus' little girl who is dying is 12 years old. And this woman that's been dealing with the issue of blood has been dealing with it now for 12 years. How many know they are connected? So you got a 12-year-old dying daughter and a 12-year-old disease. So come on, Life Church, that just means, chronologically speaking, the same year that this little girl was born was the exact same year that this woman was probably diagnosed with her disease. Come on, that that means cinematically speaking, if Mark chapter five was a movie and the producers of This Is Us were making the movie, (laughs) oh, come on, this is the scene where it would flash from the feet of Jesus and say 12 years earlier and go to a hospital and walking out of that hospital would be Jairus, his wife, and them holding a brand new baby girl with that silly new parent grin on their face. 
And then perhaps walking out of that same hospital is a woman, tears coming down her face because she's just been diagnosed with a disease that the doctors don't know what to do about it. And just maybe they were in the same hospital that day, but they couldn't even see each other. They didn't even see each other. Isn't that just like life? Isn't that just like us today? I found that sometimes you can be so preoccupied with your promise or so preoccupied with your pain that you don't see other people around you, that you just walk past people, that God actually wants to use you to be a blessing to. I don't care how good your promise or how much the pain, don't let it make you become oblivious to other people around you, that God actually might use you to speak life into them. See, we've forgotten Romans chapter 12 that says you have to rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. So thank God for Jesus that made both of them join together. 12, 12. Now the two 12s are touching. Would you just say 12? Oh, come on, across every location, say 12. Come on, say it like you had your coffee today. Say 12. Yeah. How many know you don't need a Bible college degree? Uh, you don't need to be astute in biblical numerology to know there are some numbers in the Bible God has given you biblical blues clues that these numbers are a big deal, okay? 12 is one of those numbers. 12 is a big number to God. Come on, you remember when God began his covenant with his people, a covenant that began by calling out Abraham and his son Isaac and Jacob. And he had, how many sons did Jacob have? 12 sons to remind them of the covenant, the promise with their God. Those 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 is a big number. You remember in the Old Testament, the high priest, priests would go into the Holy of Holies with a breastplate on that had 12 precious stones on it, representing those 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, too much Old Testament. Some of y'all are bored. Fast forward to the New Testament. Come on, you know our New Testament high priest is Jesus. And the first time we see Jesus teaching in the temple is at the age of 12. And they marveled at how did this junior high kid get so much power and wisdom? 12 is a big number to God. Do you know what 12 signifies in the Bible? It is a number of God's power and it is a number of God's authority. Do you know what Jesus is saying with the power of the twelves? He's saying, I don't care what sickness, disease, calamity, or problem that is in your life, there's absolutely nothing you're facing that is not under the jurisdiction of my authority and my power. He's saying through the twelve, I have the power to handle whatever's coming against you. Oh, come on, that's good news right there. 12. Yeah, that's why he called 12 disciples. If it was me, I would have stopped at 11 and said, bye, hater. I wouldn't have called Judas, but not Jesus. He called all 12 and gave all of them what? Power and authority. 12 is the number of his power. It's the number of his authority. Why is that important? It's important because it is your awareness of God's authority in your life that will determine how much you receive from him. Big statement, I'm going to say it again. It's your awareness of God's authority that will often determine how much you receive from him. See, often we look at a passage like this and we reduce it just to faith because he said, daughter, your faith has healed you. And how many know faith is important? Oh, come on, you need faith. Faith is, the, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is our anchor. But nobody takes an anchor and just throws it in the water. You're gonna lose that anchor. <laughs> you better connect and tie that anchor to something. And watch this, my faith is connected to his authority, the authority of his word, the authority of his power to know that Jesus has the final say. If you don't connect your faith to his authority, oh, you're gonna have a problem. See, some of you think you have a faith problem. You're like, ah, Robert, haven't got my breakthrough. No, because I don't have enough faith. No, it's fine, it's fine. I haven't got a miracle because my faith is not good enough. I didn't pray enough, and now it's just my faith. But your faith is good. <laughs> you know, you just need mustard seed faith. It's never the size of your faith. It is the object of your faith. And once you connect your faith to his authority, your fa uh, faith will go to a whole nother level. <laughs> but if you don't believe he's the ultimate authority, then your faith will struggle. Now give us some scripture for it, Robert. I'll give you some scripture. <laughs> Remember the disciples, they're on the boat and they're asleep and the, they're awake rather and the winds and the waves start going crazy and they're having a panic attack like, ah, just like everybody right now. Ah, what are we gonna do, what are we gonna do? 
and Jesus is chillaxing in the bottom of the boat, just, Mark says, on a pillow, sound asleep. And the disciples are like, Jesus, don't you care? We're about to die. And Jesus gets up, cool, calm, and collected, and just goes up to the edge of the boat and says, peace, be still. And in a moment, the winds and the waves and everything is calm, and the disciples drop, drop their jaw and go, who is this man? Who is this man? That even the wind and the waves obey him. And what did Jesus say back to them? Oh, you of little faith. You know why, you didn't, you know why you're shocked? Because you didn't know how much authority I had. You didn't know who I really was. You should have looked at me when I was asleep on the boat and walked up to me and said, who is this man that is sleeping and snoring in the middle of a hurricane? Look, if this storm ain't bothering him, psh, it ain't gonna bother me. Scoot over, Jesus. Let me just cuddle with you. Because if you're not stressed about this situation, why would I be stressed about the situation? Come on, somebody. God is not in heaven having a panic attack right now. He doesn't have anxiety. So you can sleep at night when you trust his authority. You don't have a faith problem. You have an awareness of his authority problem. And it's my earnest prayer that in the midst of this chaos and craziness in the world, that God would actually strengthen your faith because you will get a fresh awareness of his authority. That he has the final say. No matter what's going on, connect your faith to his authority. Can I take you deeper? Jairus... <laughs> got a house call from Jesus because that was his awareness of his authority. Ooh. Don't forget, Jairus worked in the synagogue. He's basically a pastor. And he approached Jesus just like a pastor would. He said, Jesus, oh, Sir Jesus, please, um, if you could come to the house. My daughter, she's about to die. I need you to come over and lay your hand. We already got the worship music playing. Uh, we just need you to come over and lay your hands on her. He's Pentecostal too. Lay your hands on her and she'll be healed. Jesus is like, cool, you want me to come to your house? Cool, I'll come to your house. And he starts going. This woman, oh, she had a whole nother awareness of his authority. He said, Jesus, uh-uh, you ain't got to come to my house. I ain't got time for that. All I got to do is touch the hem of your garment. And if I touch the hem of your garment, I know I'm going to be made whole. And that's what she got. You know why? because that was her awareness of his authority. You don't have a faith problem. You have an awareness of his authority problem. See, this might be one of the most important messages you ever hear as it relates to the building of your faith. Because if you don't believe that somebody is the ultimate authority, you will doubt the validity of their words. And you serve a God that says, I am the word. If you don't believe somebody is the ultimate authority, you're gonna doubt the validity of their words. Come on, you've been there before. You ever been at a place of business when, you know, they were open and everything and, and uh, you, you knew you weren't talking to the person that had like the authority, that you knew you were talking to the person that wasn't really in charge. And on top of that, they had the nerve to tell you something that was contradictory to good customer service. I mean, come on, if you're like me, you know, not rude, but just say, can I, can I please speak to the manager? Can I speak to a supervisor? Oh, y'all don't do that. Y'all are super saved. Okay. I, I want to speak. I'm not rude. I just want to speak to the person that has the real authority. This happened to me not too long ago. I'll never forget this experience. I went to a hotel that I had a reservation, had been booked for several months. And the lady behind the desk, bless her heart, she's like, um, hello, I may do. Let me see. I uh, may do. She said, no, I don't, I don't see your reservation. I said, um, but it's been booked uh, for a couple of months. She said, may do. Let me see. No, she said, no, I don't, I don't, see, I don't see your reservation. And we're fully booked. We are fully committed. There's not a single room left. I said, okay, uh, can I speak to a manager maybe or a supervisor, somebody else? She's like, oh, I can get them, but I don't know what it's going to do because I don't see your reservation. We are fully booked. We are so committed. The manager comes behind the door and goes, hello, Mr. Madu. Good to see you again. Girl, move. I am so sorry. She's new. Here's your reservation. I found I'm so sorry about that. I said, no problem. She said, no, 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 no. In fact, for all your trouble, would it be okay if we upgraded you to the executive suite? How is it I went from about to be on the street <laughs> to an executive suite? You know why? Because the right person that had the authority knew which button to push and knew what to do. Oh, 
I hope you get so annoyed by being up at night and being stressed by what's going on and all the crazy news reports that you finally just lift up your hands and say, I need to speak to the supervisor. I need to speak to the God of heaven and earth. I need to speak to the Alpha and the Omega. I need to speak to the beginning and the end. I want to speak to the one that heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. I want to speak to the one that spoke the world into existence. I want to speak to the God that has authority. Oh, I feel like preaching. Somebody give God some praise wherever you are. He's got authority. Oh, you don't have a faith problem. You got an awareness of his authority problem. Know who has the authority. This woman goes for 12 years. I've been speaking to mid-level employees. She said, I demand an appointment with the supervisor. She touched the hem of his garment. Immediately, she was healed. I'm gonna have somebody just play softly behind me. I'm landing this plane. And I could stop the miracle right there. I really could. She was healed immediately. But I can't stop the miracle there because don't forget, this woman and Jairus are connected. Touch the hem of his garment. And don't forget that before this, this woman was an interruption to Jesus' journey to Jairus' house. She was an interruption, just like what's going on in our world right now. This is the biggest interruption, but sometimes interruptions are invitations for a miracle. But Jesus was approached by Jairus first. He said, Jesus, you gotta come to the house. Please, my daughter is dying. How many you know time is of the essence? Jesus did not have time to waste. It's like, hurry up. And I can see Jesus going through the crowd and Jairus is probably leading him. Come on, I'll show you where my house is. Come on, follow me. Come on, Jesus, hurry up, hurry up. No, I got to him first. Hold on. He's got to get through the crowd of people and he's forcing his way through and he checks back to make sure Jesus is still there. Okay, you there? Okay, come on. And he's going through the crowd, going through the crowd. And all of a sudden, he looks back and he's lost Jesus in the crowd. He's like, where did he go? I told him this is an emergency. What is he doing? All of a sudden, he finds Jesus surrounded by people talking about who touched me. And Jairus is like, are you serious right now? I just told you this is an emergency. What do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you, Jesus. You want to stop and play 21 questions when my daughter is dying? Oh, isn't that frustrating when God makes you wait? Not only does he stop, he waits for this woman to come out of the crowd. How long did, did that take for her to sheepishly come through and admit it was me? Then he just starts sitting there talking to her while Jairus has to wait. And I can see the steam coming off of Jairus' forehead like, are you serious right now? And the Bible says that Jesus just let her tell him the whole truth. Another version says she told him her whole story. Have you ever had a lady tell you her whole story? Ladies, ladies I love you, I'm saying, but if you're in a hurry, have a dude tell you his story because it'd be like, I'm good. But when a lady tells you her whole story, get you a comfortable seat. How long was this conversation? I can see the steam coming off of Jairus' forehead like, oh my goodness, girl, get your healing and go. We got to get to my house. It's frustrating when God makes you watch a miracle while you're waiting on your miracle. Isn't that frustrating? You have to watch other people get a promotion and you lost your job. Watch other people post pictures of their baby on Instagram and Facebook and you can't have a child yourself. What do you do when Jesus makes you watch a miracle while you're waiting on a miracle? Watch other people walk down the aisle. You've been to a hundred weddings. Some of them you're looking at like, God, for real? She got a husband for real? What do you do when he makes you watch a miracle while you're waiting on your miracles? He, was, he will often make you watch a miracle while you're waiting on your miracle. And it is not to discourage you, it is to encourage you, to let you know that if God did it for them, he can do it for you too. It might not be the same way, but if you'll just trust him and know that he has all power and authority, that's why he was able to heal this woman and even go to the house. When Jairus thought all hope was lost, he said, don't be afraid, just believe. He walks all the way to the house. They already started the funeral. Jesus goes, why y'all crying? That girl's not dead. She's just asleep. And they laugh at him. He said, oh, you think that's funny? Oh, you think that's funny? Every one of y'all that laughed, I got a word. Get. Oh, come on. Help me close this message, Life Church. Get. Come on, somebody across every location, just say, get. Get. 
Come on, this is your season to start doing some cleaning and start checking your environment and telling some things enough is enough. You've got to get out. Somebody needs to tell fear to get out. Tell depression to get out. Tell anxiety to get out. Somebody give God some praise if you know he's got authority and some things need to get Get out. Get out. As every head be bowed, all eyes closed. God is a God of environment. Some things will not get up till first some things get out. Perhaps the world has stopped. Everybody's on pause. Maybe we have an opportunity to check our environment. Some things that you've been putting up with for a long time that need to get out. Maybe a relationship. Some of you need to speak to your own thoughts and tell them to get out. Just because you thought it doesn't mean it's your thought. Tell that thought of suicide to get out. Replace it with the Word of God. Tell that thought of giving up to get out. Tell that thought that God has abandoned you to get out. He's with you even in the pain. Get out so that the dead things can get up. Father, I pray, whoever's watching this message right now, you give them the strength to speak to things that need to get out. Lord, you allow them to rest in the confidence you have all power, you have all authority, you have the final say. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless your life, church. Amen. Thank you. Everybody say get out. All of our churches, if you're praying for something to get out, would you just lift up your hands right now? If there's something you need to go away. Father, we pray the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name. God, do miracles. As many of you are praying to get out, there are some of you, you need to pray, come in. Come into my life, Jesus. I need your grace. At all of our churches, or those of you watching online, some of you recognize I don't know God, I don't know his forgiveness. Jesus is the Son of God, he is the authority. He gave his life so we could be forgiven. Those of you who would say, I want his grace, today I turn from my sins, I give him my life. Jesus, come in, I surrender to you. Would you lift up your hands right now and say yes, Jesus, I surrender. Those of you online, just say, I'm giving my life to Jesus today. And as you do, the angels in heaven rejoice because you're becoming new. Pray aloud, just pray. Heavenly Father, forgive my sins. Jesus, save me. Fill me with your spirit. I want to know you. I want to serve you. I give you my life. Thank you for new life. You have mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Life Church, could you celebrate big? Welcome those born into God's family. If you're lonely, longing for someone to hear you, If your burdens feel like more than you can bear If you're searching for a place to just be honest Come just as you are If you're tired of just hoping for an answer If you're wishing you could let your God come down If you feel like you can hold it all together Come just as you are There's no need for any hiding At the Father's house you met with open arms And He gives grace with 
without condition As you are with nothing else just come There is space for everyone who feels unworthy A place for those who've never felt at home Where you don't have to wonder if you're wanted Come just as you are There's a hope The one who makes the broken whole again Now there's no need for you to pick up all the pieces Hey, come just as you are Jesus, come to Jesus, come, come, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. Maybe you have never trusted him at all This safety here to wrestle with your questions Come just as you